Welcome. Welcome to the University of Iowa Libraries. Uh, my name is John Colshaw. I have the privilege to serve as the Jack B. King University Librarian uh, here at the UI. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to see many of you here from the opening reception for Hey Buddy, I'm Bill, this semester's exhibit in our main library gallery. The exhibit showcases the extraordinary life and legacy of Bill Sachter, an Iowa City resident whose story reflected and impacted the history of disability rights nationwide. First, I would like to take a moment to show gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Beswaki, and Sauk nations and all other indigenous peoples who have inhabited this space. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from Emmy and Academy Award winning screenwriter, Barry Morrow, who was one of Bill's best buddies. So, hey buddy, I'm Bill, was co-curated by Brad Ferrier, uh, the digital projects librarian in special, special collections and archives at the UI libraries. Brad's up at the back. and Jen Knights, the Marketing and Communications Manager for Performing Arts at Iowa in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I'd like to, where is she? Oh, behind me. You. <laughs> she was down there. So I'd like to invite Jen to give a few words and introduce our guest of honor. Thank you, John. Um, another hand for combined efforts. Excellent work. I was moving in my seat. Um, so yes, I co-curated the Hey Buddy, I'm Bill exhibit um, with my friend Brad. So hey buddies, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it means a lot to be here in this room together with you and also with Barry and Bertie. Um, it's been a delight to spend the day with you today. And I just want to say, um, you know, as I said in, inside the gallery, and some of you were there and some of you were not, this story really is all about friendship, about buddies, and about storytelling. Um, almost everything I learned about Bill and his story came either directly or in indirectly from Barry. So there's really not much more for me to say. You guys are in for a treat because Barry is a wonderful storyteller, and I will not delay any longer. Come on up, Barry. Barry Morrow. This is me, okay. Yeah, so the, you know, the thing you always ask yourself before you decide to come across the country and give a little talk is what could go wrong? And um, about four minutes ago, I felt the front tooth and it fell out. <laughs> Does anybody have any super glue? Uh, <laughs> no, okay. Well, if it falls out, you'll just pretend you didn't see it, okay? Yeah. You told me that Dennis was no good, and you're absolutely right. Um, Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You, you can go home again. But when you do, and you arrive in the middle of the night, like we did last night in Iowa City, and it had a skyline. And I wasn't used to that. Uh, it had tall buildings. When we left in 1981, it was a, still a town. And now it's a pretty, pretty big and healthy looking city. It's beautiful, but I was also kind of sad when things change. Um, but we have this amazing exhibit out there to remind us the way we were. On November 6, 1920, seven-year-old William Sachter entered the gates of the Faribault State School for the feeble-minded and epileptic, never to see his family again. 
Bill was born in Minneapolis in 1913, the youngest child of, of three to Russian Jewish immigrants who opened a little store in North, Northeast Minneapolis and managed it for a few years. Then when Bill was five, his father passed away. It was a depression. Times were hard. Living was hard. And Bill had a hard time when he entered school. He, well, they sent him home a number of times. I was told with a pin, note pinned to his lapel that said that Bill was not ready for school. And his mother misunderstood. She felt his clothes weren't appropriate. They weren't good enough. And so she saved and she darned and knitted or whatever she had to do and sent him back again. And after three times, a social worker visited the house and said that Bill would never be ready for school. Mary Sachter, his mother, signed the papers giving this, the state custody and Bill became a ward. And Bill became a number. It was 5523. You'll see it out there in the exhibit. It's a little, little pin that he wore on his a suit lapel. Um, they didn't care about names in those days. The patients were actually referred to as inmates. Bill was there for 44 years. And when I asked him once, what it was like to, to be in a place, any place like that, I can find. He said, you know, buddy, I was there so long, I didn't even know I was there. A very kind of sort of a Buddhist take on it. Um, decades passed, and Bill worked very hard. I, I know some of the jobs he had. Um, pushing food carts under these underground tunnels in Minnesota during the winter. And they, they were very, you know, heavy. And Bill, but Bill was young and strong, and he was admired for his hard work. And somewhere along the way, he, he learned to play the harmonica. There goes that tooth. What a dumb thing to happen. If I swallow the tooth, <laughs> we're really in trouble. One moment, please. It's going in my pocket. <laughs> I have insurance. <laughs> we're all good. Anyway, as early as 1939, uh, agencies were trying to find a way to place Bill in the community, but they never did. By the mid-1960s, uh, the concept of deinstitutionalization became the law of the land, and institutions across this country emptied out their patients into the, the cities and towns across the country. Uh, they didn't all survive. Tuberculosis had, was rampant in institutions. Uh, Bill had probably never seen a doctor, certainly had never seen a dentist. When I met him, he had my problem. <laughs> uh, but now in his 50s, with deinstitutionalization, Bill finally got on that same train that he rode to Faribault, and it took him back to Minneapolis. He had come home. I was uh, just out of college in 1972, and one October evening, while I was waiting in the parking lot for my wife, Bev, also known as Birdie, because that's what the grandkids call her, so for 20 years she'd been Birdie, here in Iowa, she was known as, as Bev. Um, but she was working as a cocktail waitress in a very fancy, exclusive, button-down country club called the Minnacotta Club. 
And um, Bill was a pot scrubber. And she told me about this man named Bill, how sweet he is, was, and, and how kind. And, and, uh, and I knew about him because in the parking lot where I would wait for, for Bertie to come home or to come out of the work every, every night, up in the window, there would be this smiling face with not too many teeth in it. And he would wave, and I'd wave back. And, and he'd wave again. I'd wave back, and then he'd wave again, and then I would sort of turn and pretend I was somewhere else because it was sort of getting a little hard to keep up with his waver. But eventually, there was a Christmas party. And that night, all the members and stayed home, and the staff took over the asylum. And boy, did we. Uh, the problem was they were serving champagne, and it was free. And I had never had it before. And I made sure I had my fill. So by the time I found Bill sitting in the back all by himself, staring into a glass of water, um, I was ready to party. And so was Bill. As I walked up to him, because he recognized me from all that waving, he stood up and he said, hey, buddy, I'm Bill. And that's why the name of this exhibit is just so precious to me. Um, it harkens back to those early days. Uh, after uh, the party, we went, I went home. And then um, that was that. Uh, I don't. I didn't remember giving Bill my phone number, uh, nor did I even believe he could read, and he couldn't. But he could do something better than that. He could find people who could read and dial a phone. And it's the phone rang at about 7:30 in the morning after that night out, and I was. Um, first of all, I forgot. What my, the promises that I had made. So I assumed I had made them. By the way, I've only had champagne a few times since, and only one glass. <laughs> Follow my advice. Anyway, he's, a woman was on the phone, and she said, hi, I'm Bill's dialer. And he's been waiting for you now for some time. Bill who and waiting where? It all came back to me, finally, and I went over to pick him up. And it was snowing. Man, this is Minneapolis in the winter. And I looked all around for him outside. He had a little room in the, in the, in the back of the country club. And there were a number of employees they had who were disabled. And I really thought that was pretty cool that they, you know, that they had jobs. But um, I, I couldn't see Bill at all. So I honked the horn. That's all I could think of doing. And all of a sudden, from the stairs, stairway outside this building, a man emerged. He'd been covered with snow. <laughs> and he shook himself off like an old bear and uh, came right for the car like this and opened the car, got in, slammed it so hard the door handle came off in his in his hand, a little bit like this tooth here. And um, I said, what's up? And he said, you promised you'd take me to get toothpaste and wig spray. I said, toothpaste and wig spray? Well, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. I think we got to wait before we're going to find a store open that's going to sell us toothpaste and uh, wig spray. So how about we just take a little ride around town? And we did. And it changed me because I was sitting next to a person who hadn't really seen the world. This was Rip Van Winkle. And he was riding shotgun. And he was loving everything we saw. A school bus went by. Hey, buddy, see that bus? This, see, other kids, wave, see? And they're going to school, buddy. They're going to learn to read. And they're going to just have a, and they're nice people here. Look, see that guy? He's a, he's a mailman. And that's a movie theater. And, and you could see a movie if you, if you went into that movie theater, buddy. 
And um, okay, that sounds kind of annoying, but it wasn't. It was so pure and so and so real. And I I was looking at my town, my movie theater, my school buses in a in a new way. I, I was kind of appreciating this the minutia that was so new and and vibrant to him. Um, I told you he played the harmonica, and he played right there in the car for me, um, a polka. He had four songs, and, and three were polkas. And the other one, he couldn't tell me what it was, and nobody ever could. He also showed me his lucky piece, his $2 bill, which he had kept in his wallet from the days of the institution. I believe his mother may have sent it to him to buy some candy or whatever, but uh, he kept it in his wallet, and he said that was his good luck piece. Um, I'm gonna go to the end of our story, and then I'll come back. The end of the story is when we were coming to Iowa, I mean, when we were leaving Iowa and going to California, um, we, we asked Bill if he would go with us, and he said, oh, buddy, I can't go with you now. I live in Iowa. I got a job. I make coffee. He said, but I got something for you. He reached into his wallet, and he took out that $2 bill, and he handed it to me. And he said, if you're going to California, you're going to need this more than me. <laughs> But he, uh, he said his goal in life was to become a regular good man. Now, a regular good man has to have certain things. A regular good man has to have a regular good job. A regular good man has to have uh, uh, a, a regular good buddy, he said as he looked at me. And he said a regular good man has to have hair. I said, well, what, why does a, you don't ha have to have hair to be a regular good man. He said, well, you got hair. How would you know? He said, so that's why I wear my cap and my wig, because I want people to think I'm a regular good man, not a crack-minded man. Well, our friendship um, lasted for over a year when uh, something extraordinary happened. Two things. One, my wife said we're having a baby. Two, I had to get a real job. And, you know, being a freelance photographer, doing videotape documentaries, selling encyclopedias, I sold one. Another, another sign here. The heck? Um, <laughs> I said, what can go wrong? And we've seen two so far. The third to charm, you all know it. Anyway, um, I got a job offer out of state to be a media specialist at a place called the University of Iowa. And it was a long ways away, I told Bill. And, but I'm, I need to be a regular good man and be able to take care of my, the new baby we're gonna have. And uh, frankly, that was the worst news that Bill had ever heard, that his family was leaving him again. Now I told my wife earlier, I said, before I get up on the stage today, the last words I want you to say are, don't cry, okay? And you didn't say it, did you? And I, I'll just admit it right now because I mean, it'll happen. Um, when you go back into the past and you go back into Bill's past, um, I mean, there's so much joy there. But you also have to embrace the 44 years of pain 
and factor that in every time you were with Bill. Now, he wouldn't. He didn't look back. But somebody had to. And somebody had to tell his story. I didn't know that quite yet, but it was coming up. So um, we left for Iowa, leaving Bill behind because he was a ward of the state. We couldn't simply take him with us, even though we had wanted to. Uh, and for the first six months here in Iowa City, it was great. Well, actually, we lived on a, uh, a farm. We, we rented a farm. Um, it was a suburb of Kelowna. I call it a suburb of Kelowna <laughs> because the town was called Richmond and it had 18 people in it. And when we moved in, well, one day after Bill did eventually join us, um, there were four of us and I stopped my car and I crossed it out and I, I added four more people. So I updated their sign. But um, we'd been gone six months when I got a phone call late, late in the day, early evening, from a Bill's social worker saying that they had found him passed out on the side of the road. And um, they didn't know how long he'd been there, but uh, he was in terrible pain. In fact, he passed out from the pain. And it was this ulcerated leg that I knew about, and we Bill and I together used to change his bandages, and, 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 it, and it, was, it was pretty good. But when we left, Bill's world crumbled, and he just stopped doing everything. Stopped shaving, stopped bathing, stopped eating, st uh, and stopped taking care of his leg. And the social worker said, you know, they're going to have to amputate it. And, um, since he has no next of kin, we were hoping that you might come uh, back to explain that to him. And so I made the drive from Iowa City to Minneapolis and got there late in the morning. And there were a group of doctors con conferencing outside this area. And I, I spoke with them and I said, Just, you know, what's the, what's the thing? And they said, well, yeah, we, we're going to have to take this leg because obviously he can't care for it. It's life-threatening. And um, I said, well, I, I understand, but now obviously you'll fit him with a prosthesis, and then how long will the rehab be before he can go back to work? Because work is his, is his identity, really. And they said, he's not going back to work. He's going to have to go back to the institution. There's just no solution. And that's when I decided to kidnap him. Um, I'll just make this quick allusion to Rain Man, but what's it about? A brother kidnapping his brother, right? And going on the run. And that's essentially what happened. It, it took a little bit more time than that. But we, uh, we went out the back door of that hospital. And when we got him to Iowa City, I took him out to Oakdale, where the uh, Department of Family Practice was in those days. And they thought Bill was a, just a great challenge for these second year residents. And he had the best care of anybody in, t in, in town. And, um, and we saved that leg. And Bill had it when he died. And uh, that wouldn't have happened but for, <sighs> Well, really, I have to, I really have to credit the social worker for not excluding me and for treating me as the, as the family member I, I, I was of Bill. Anyway, I, I uh, went into Bill's room uh, and uh, he was, he, you know, he lit up. Buddy, hey, buddy, let's play a tune, rip and snort. And I said, Bill, shh. This is, I'm, I'm not really in a great mood right now because here's the thing. You knew how to take care of your leg. We did that every day, right? Oh, yeah, buddy, we did. We did a good job. Well, then you stop. And guess what? Now you're going to have to move to Iowa. <laughs> and out the door we went. Actually, they caught up with this later, and I had to go back to Minneapolis and explain what the heck 
you know, a young 20-something year old guy wanted with a 60 year old guy. And, and I didn't have any easy answer for them other than we just got along great. Um, so we uh, lived on this farm in Richmond and, and Bill, he needed, he needed to be in the city. He really needed to be around people. And he didn't like chickens. And did he? He hated that rooster, remember? It attacked him. Our, our son Clay, who was now growing up a little bit, and Bill would go out every morning together, hand in hand, and they'd go to the chicken house, and they'd bring back in some eggs. And we had like 200 chickens, so it was like a lot of eggs. Uh, but the farmer up the road really took care of all the livestock. We just, I just pretended I was a gentleman farmer. Um, but um, the, uh, the need for Bill to be in the city was um, met finally by an ad I saw in the Press Citizen. That's the paper, right? Press, yeah, Press Citizen. Somebody, in fact, at School of Social Work had set their cup of coffee on, on this newspaper. And when I went to get the coffee cup back, I noticed that it left a ring around a, an ad for a room to let. And talk about divine coffee rings. Um, uh, and it was a, a woman in her late 70s, early 80s named May Driscoll. And May had, May was, a, was an angel. Um, she grew flowers and sold them, violets. And she took care of three people with disabilities. And she thought Bill would just be a wonderful new addition to their menagerie. And uh, so that's where Bill ended up in Iowa City on Ubel Street. And, well, finding his way to work was a huge task. And so he had to learn to take the city bus. And it was the toughest lesson he had ever had. And the same for me. Because I would, he'd, I'd see the bus come, Bill would get on, the bus would go off, and I'd follow behind in the car, waiting for him to get to where he's supposed to get off, and he'd get off three blocks earlier. And I go, no, no, no. Uh, and then we'll try it again the next day. So it's, it's not really unlike when I brought our kids to school for the first time. You know, you can't just expect them to find their way home. And so, but Bill mastered the bus route and uh, in fact became such a, a figure, a beloved figure on that bus that when he was hospitalized for something else a few years later, uh, uh, the bus driver left the route, went over to Mercy Hospital around the side and leaned on the horn until Bill looked down and everybody in the bus waved and then they, they went on their way. Uh, then Bill needed, you know, something to do. Uh, and the School of Social Work, which was my main employer, um, had a saint for a director. His name was Tom Waltz. And yeah, there's Tommy up there. And, um, and he became also one of Bill's very, very best buddies. Uh, but uh, and Tom had a, a brother I knew, because I knew Tom in Minneapolis, who uh, was mentally retarded. And so he was very, very, um, you know, understanding of what we were trying to do with Bill and wanted to help in any way he could. So he said, we can give job, uh, a, a Bill a, a janitor job. He can clean windows. He can sweep the floors. And Bill was all for that. So the first day I trained Bill on how to squeegee a window. And um, sure enough, he did a good job. So I left him there, went about my business, came back about four hours later. Bill was squeegeeing the same window pane. He hadn't moved on down the line like I expected him to. So, and then the janitor, uh, the, the floor mopping didn't go well either because 
if he was mopping the floor, you students better get out of the way. <laughs> so we tried a few other gimmicks, and then one day, a light bulb went off. The School of Social Work had a vending machine just as you entered. The vending machine, I think it was a dime, would give you a cup of black coffee, coffee with cream, coffee with sugar and cream, um, chicken broth, and cocoa. I told this earlier today, and I forgot the cocoa. Oh, anyway, your dime would give you a cup of whatever button you press, but it all came through the same tube. So no matter what your coffee was, it tasted like chicken, and it tasted like cocoa. <laughs> Some people liked it, but uh, most didn't. And we all realized what we needed was coffee. And so I went to Kmart out in the mall and bought a Mr. Coffee and uh, brought it back. And I, I spent a number of days with Bill, you know, going through the steps. And finally, he said he was ready to take the test. So I asked Tom Waltz, the director of the school, to come in and watch Bill make coffee. And, uh, and he says, yeah, you, you put the water in the top. You put the filter. And then you put the filter in the thing. And then you press, the, you press this. And then, and then, hey, buddy, ain't working. I said, just Bill, give it some time. You know, you got to give it some time. Everything takes, be patient. Sure enough, about 30 seconds later, bubble, 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 drip, drip, drip. Hey, buddy, I'm making coffee. I'm making damn coffee. I never heard Bill say a swear word until then. So I could tell he was excited. And then uh, Tom said, Bill, I think you found yourself a job. And so he served coffee out of that Mr. Coffee until it became, the line got so long that we actually decided we needed a bigger space. And Tom gave us the largest space in North Hall to build Wild Bill's coffee shop. And all the students uh, uh, pitched in, and we laid the, uh, well, we didn't lay the flooring, because I saw it today, and that, that flooring predates us. But everything else we did. And it was a beautiful spot, and all the tables you saw earlier, them, oh, there's Bill sitting at one of them. He and Tom Walsh refinished all the furniture that was in that place. The students did macrame and whatever was in vogue in those days. And it was a, it was a very, very popular spot to be in. And, in. and it still is, but for other reasons, because there were no Starbucks in those days. There wasn't probably a good cup of coffee in a half a mile of North Hall. And now they're all over. So North Hall, the Wild Bill's coffee shop has evolved. It's still Wild, Wild Bill's, but it's a learning center now. And Bill would be, I think, very happy to know that he's helping students learn, because he always called them students. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, one day, this, a bunch of students came to me and said, uh, Barry, we would like to nominate Bill for the handicap uh, employee of the year at the university. And um, they said, but we don't know anything about him. And uh, we can't fill out the forms. And now the form was made for, you know, academicians, you know, professors, people maybe in a wheelchair, what have you. But um, there's nothing that sort of fit Bill's profile, like what distinguished articles and things are you published. And, you know, I wrote, uh, you know, does not apply, does not apply, does not apply. At the bottom, there was a question, and it said, what other qualities might, you know, uh, this person possessed to be worthy of such an award? I saw my opening. I said, see attached. And I sat down, and I wrote Bill's story. Of course, I could only tell it from my perspective, so it's sort of Bill and Barry's story. And I showed it to Tom, showed it to other people, gave it to my parents, passed it around. It was wonderful. Everybody loved it. And 
I don't know how to this day exactly it all happened, but I got a phone call from one of the upper echelon people at CBS television saying, we want to make a TV movie of your story with Bill. And um, when I told Bill, he said, hey, we don't need them. We didn't make our own movie, buddy. You got a camera. We'll make our own damn movie, you know. Well, no, Bill, this could be special, you know, if we could pull this off. And so, um, uh, oh, let me go back to the coffee thing for one more, one more second. Because that coffee that Bill made saved his life, too. That gave him a reason to get up a reason to get on the bus, a reason to go every day, put a smile on, play his harmonica for the students. And, and of all the places he could have landed, imagine in a school of social work, how much they were getting from him as well. Anyway, I, uh, uh, they sent this thing I'd written off. And uh, uh, I didn't, in fact, we didn't hear him for months and months and months. And, and Bill finally said, whatever happened to that uh, Harmonica Award? <laughs> I said, Harmonica Award? Oh, you mean the Handicap Award? Yeah, that one. I said, well, I don't know, Bill. They, I, we haven't heard. He said, well, they never even heard me play. How are they going to know? <laughs> Bill became a, a, one of the five finalists for handicapped American. It, it went right past the university, to past the state, to the region. He went right to the top. And Bill and I were invited to Washington, DC. And we met President Carter and First Lady. And uh, I remember Bill in Lincoln's study, because Bill had grown his beard by then. And he was looking at Lincoln and <laughs> doing his beard, you know. He says, yeah, everybody, they had beards, you know, buddy, you know, where's your beard? I said, Bill, I can't grow a beard. I said, I barely grow a mustache on one side. He says, well, that's too bad for you. But um, so we're going to make a movie. And uh, I'm going to spare you two years of real pain and sorrow, because that's what you go through before you ever even get close to making a movie. But I do remember when I dropped Bill off after having spoken to the producers, um, I said, Bill, they found an actor, an actor who's going to play you in the movie. Who's that? I said, his name is Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney? Oh, boy. Mickey Rooney now. There's a good guy. I used to see Mickey Rooney, yeah. And back in, they used to show a movie and Mickey Rooney. Oh, and he said, wait, I got to go, buddy. And off he went into the house, and into May's house. And Angela and Kenny and the others were there. And I heard him say, because it boomed out through the screen door, guess what, everybody? I'm going to be Mickey Rooney. <laughs> um, Everyone was surprised how well it did. Even the executives in charge told me, Barry, don't expect much. It's right before Christmas. People are busy. There's so much competition for these stories. And they were like, you know, preparing me for like, nobody watched the movie. Uh, everybody watched the movie. Everybody watched the movie. It was amazing. And the calls and things came flooding in, but also to Bill, cards and letters and and people driving through uh, Iowa on their way to someplace else would stop in Iowa City to see Bill in his coffee shop. And it, it even had um, the rare television sequel. Uh, and that's because, well, as Eunice Shriver, who, you know, is John Kennedy's sister, told me, uh, and I didn't realize this, but this was the first a uh, sympathetic portrayal of a person with mental retardation who was the hero. You know, there had been secondary char characters in that, and uh, but this was um, Bill's story. 
and Mickey Rooney's story, really, in a way. But throughout this whole thing, Bill remained completely unspoiled. Uh, if you asked him about his celebrity status, he would just say, oh, yeah, the coffee business picking up, buddy. Oh, yeah. You didn't make a movie, that's it, didn't it? It comes to buy coffee. So, um, I, I, the worst day of my life was the one that came that said he was gone. Students, the same students who you know, had had me write this thing up, um, had uh, told me that their plan was to nominate him as homecoming king. And they said, he'll win. But he didn't make it. And uh, Bill, you know, he didn't ride in that parade. But he, um, every day he was ready for work. Every day he had his lunch pail. Every day he sat in that easy chair waiting to hear the bus sound outside. Uh, only this time he didn't answer the bell. The funeral in Iowa City at Hillel um, was uh, overflowing. Um, all three networks had vans outside, reporters. It was insane that this little man who played the harmonica and made coffee would elicit this kind of expression of love. And that night when we watched the news, Dan Rather said, America has lost a true hero. <laughs> Sorry. I just bawled my eyes out. Well, you know, I, the, the, the thing is, 99% of the stories are funny, OK? Why I pick these, I don't know. Uh, but there, there was just so much more to tell. So after um, I got over Bill's loss, I decided, OK, I know what to do. I'm going to de devote one week of the year in, on some, in some charity thing and re like really dig in. And I picked the Association for Retarded Citizens. And I eventually became part of the National Committee and all of that stuff. And in fact, one day I was uh, at a meeting in, in, uh, in Texas, and there was a coffee break. And I went down the hallway, and I heard this odd sound coming from the other side of the room. And I opened the door, and I saw this fellow looking up at some, a bookcase, and he's <laughs> and I, I said, hi, hey, is everything OK in here? And he turned around and he said, think about yourself, Barry Morrow. <laughs> I just met Rain Man. And that's a whole other story. I'm not going to go into that here, because this is Bill's night. But I want you to see how you know the dots connect. And they've connected in such a rewarding way. It's sustained us for, through our 54 years. I really want to thank everybody who put on this event the exhibit, Sarah and Paula and Pete and um, Brad and Jen, and I'm going to forget somebody here, of course. But uh, I'd really like to just let them know what this means to, to Bertie and me, and also what it means to this community. So I'd like to thank Iowa City for being at home. And now I'd like to sit down.
Thank you. Should be live if you put that in your pocket. Yeah. Let's see, am I on? I'm so glad I had all those pictures taken before the tooth fell out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I guess we're going to do some QA. And uh, I've got a mic out here. I'm going to help um, bring that to people who have questions. Here's your first one. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm too young to remember Bill firsthand. Hello. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, the closest person I can think of to Bill would be Gary Bloor, known locally as Smiley, who uh, was more, more independent than Bill. Mm -hmm. How much of Bill's limitations came from uh, an innate uh, lack of intelligence, and how much of them came from being in the, an institution that mistreated him for 44 years? You know, um, Bill, I hit like four IQ tests that I saw. And they ranged like from 38 to 74 or something. Uh, and so that's when I realized there's different kinds of intelligence. Because Bill could tell you, or tell me, as we were driving the car, who was going to wave at him and who wasn't. Because some, he could see you know, through the glass into the other car that person driving, if Bill waved, they would wave back. And then sometimes he wouldn't wave. And then he'd wave, and they'd wave back. And I thought, well, of course, people wave back, because when you wave at them, they wave back. No, I tried it. I waved, some people waved, lots of people didn't wave back. So, I mean, that's just one of the little things about Bill, is that he had, if he were here now, and you didn't know anything about him, when you go home, you'd be talking about, did you see that guy with the beard? Did you talk to him? Wasn't he funny? Wasn't he nice? Wasn't he whatever? You know, I mean, he made an impact. So I don't think his disabilities really stopped him from wringing every bit of joy out of life. And what would he have been like if he had not been Oh, if he had not been? Oh, gosh. You know, I used to think that he could have achieved a lot. Uh, I think he. I mean, Bernie tried to teach him to write his name uh, and worked on it, you know, and he was able to write B and then L and then another L and then he would dot one of the L's. Because he said it saved ink. <laughs> That's intelligence. Um, you know, what would, you know, what, where would any of us be if we'd gone left instead of right, you know? Mm. If she hadn't sat in front of me in art class <laughs> um, in 11th grade, where I could mess with her hair and make her mad, you know, I don't know where we'd be. So it's an interesting question. Uh, all I can say is, thank God we don't have those institutions anymore. Yeah. Anyone else? Question? Comment? Somebody usually asks, hey, I wrote a screenplay. Can you get it made for me? <laughs> Nobody? Yeah. Here we go. We have Avi here. Um. Lane Wyrick in the back. Um, his documentary is, to my family, the most valuable artifact, if that's what you can call it, that we have. Because Lane spent years uh, and worked when he shouldn't have on this, really. 
but he, he sacrificed a lot to tell the story, uh, A Friend in Need, the Bill Sackner story, which has been seen probably by millions of people, Lane, I'm sure by now, because it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it, it's available first through his website and everything else, but now it's pretty much readily available everywhere. And um, it tells the story of Bev and Barry and Bill and all the people involved uh, and all the people you've seen up here, but another filmmaker did it, not me. That's what makes it so valuable. You know, anybody can write their own story, make a movie about themselves, get Dennis Quaid to play you, why not? <laughs> but um, what Lane did was just a gift, and you know, we're grateful, that's all I can say. Hello, we're doing Mary. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, about the writing process, the grueling two years that you had briefly mentioned, mm -hmm. and um, just kind of how much of that was spent with Bill and and what kind of hand he had in the writing process and, and creating the story for um, the television movie. Well, uh, you know, I observed it all, and I, I never made notes or like I would for another project. I didn't do research. I didn't do any of the things you do normally on a screenplay. I mean, sometimes I'll spend six months or a year researching something, and then screenplay kind of pops up maybe three months later, and then rewrite and stuff. With Bill, it was just all, I had no, no goal, you see. I had no, no, nobody to send it to. I didn't see a movie. It was just biography, autobiography. And so, uh, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you're a reporter. You didn't tell them that. <laughs> she's, she's trying to use your time to do her job right here. <laughs> And by the way, Daily Island was just, uh, uh, and, and the, yeah, Daily Island, right? That's, was um, also, see, there's so many pieces of this puzzle that if you don't have them all, you don't have anything. And the publicity that the Bill was given through that, and then the movie, and the, we had a premiere for the Bill's movie at Hampshire Auditorium. And CBS, Big wigs, a few of them came for it. You know, Bill was in a tux. We were all, in it was, uh, you know, talk about a triumph. And then years later, when Lane made his brilliant documentary, that screened at Hancher Auditorium. And the next day, it was flooded. So we brought the house down, literally. <laughs> Anybody else? It could be a stupid question because I have lots of stupid answers. Yes. Where did you uh, where did you pick that up? Like growing up, anywhere you body of like building up those non traditional relationships and. Sure. Are, you, are you asking me about my own family and background and why, yeah. why we would do this, right? Yeah, yeah. We did it yeah. because we were idiots. <laughs> and we were young. And it's just like, you know, people who decide one day, oh, that's a really cute dog. They don't realize that dogs only live 20 years. And, you know, having kids is even worse. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I, I would have to, you know, credit my parents for whatever I am. Um, they, you know, they took in people too. Um, and so, you know, you model what you, I mean, they model what, what you're supposed to do and if you're smart, you follow them. So, uh, and they love Bill, you know. Now, in the Bill movie, the director said, there's no tension. This scene with the chicken where Bill comes over and, and, you, and, and, you, and he takes like four pieces, which really happened. My, my parents were, were amused, you know, and it was like, you know, and I said, Bill, that's, what, you know, put that chicken back. Barry, it's fine. Bill can have whatever he wants. The movie, I mean, my parents suddenly went up about, like, four stages of, of you know, wealth in, in the movie. Uh, they have a, a, 
a maid serving the chicken food. And it's like, hey, mom and dad, I want you to meet Bill. How do you do, Bill? You know, and like, when you are at home and you watch this movie you've been telling everybody about, your parents, and you see this in a scene before you, they do, it's so, I've never really been able to enjoy the movie because there's these cringe-worthy moments that I know are coming. And, but I also know now on the other side of the equation that movies need this. You know, they, as you know, conflict, conflict, conflict. My own personal discovery in writing screenplays is that you could never be too cruel. You can never be too cruel to your, to your person because it, that's what garners the empathy. That's what, te what tells people why they are, you know, have to stay invested in this story. Because you know, at every turn, the person that they you know, see as themselves, which is what you have to get them to do too, um, they see him, that, that goal, that dream threatened. And uh, there wasn't a lot of that in the, in, in the real life story other than you know, there's bad legs and there's bureaucracies and there's all that to get through. But um, it was easier than the movie suggests, but that's perhaps why the movie was so successful because in the end, Bill does triumph. And if anybody stood in the way of that, they're villains. Even uh, the portrayal of, of, of Bertie, by, or Bev, or whatever your name is, uh, <laughs> was, was, uh, was very strange because she was uh, a, a antagonistic in some ways to all the time her husband was spending with this guy, Bill. And now she's pregnant, and they're gonna, we're going to have a baby, and you're off with Bill, and you know, and, and all that's, that, that's uh, understandable. It's not true. That wasn't what she was like at all. But if you didn't do that, people are going to say, all these people are nuts. You know, <laughs> he brings on this guy and always goes, why not, you know? And um, so, yeah, you have, to, you, can't, you have to kind of roll. Don't have a movie done about yourself. Just save yourself you know, all the agony and, you know, you'll be fine. Mm. Um, well, I, Bill said he didn't have any. But um, about, oh, well, we were still in Iowa City, so uh, it was sometime before, you know, 1980 probably. Um, I discovered that he, I did find his sister, Sarah. And uh, she's in Bay City, Michigan. And I called her up without Bill there first time because I knew that this might be a shock. And it was more than a shock because she and her sister were told that Bill died. One more cry because this is the killer. So Bill was saving his money to meet her, to fly to meet her. And of course, I would go with him. So I was saving my money too. And then she died. And um, that was the only time Bill ever cried. OK, now something funny. We're going to go off one for go off funny. Some, can we? All right, let me rack my brain. Uh, Bertie, any ideas? Or are we so late that we have no time for funny? Uh, no, we have time for funny. Oh, OK. <laughs> Please. Sure, Santa Claus is good. Now, we had, um, I was really hoping to see uh, Rabbi Portman here. Uh, uh, I hope he's okay. I'm, I'm going to try and see if we, you know, somebody can find him, so I'll at least talk to him on the phone. But um, Tom, Tom Walsh, had, I told you his brother was retarded, and his brother used to be Santa Claus every year. Then his brother died, and he had this Santa Claus outfit, and it pretty much fit Bill. And Bill grew his Santa Claus beard. And so Tom would take Bill at Christmas time to uh, some shut-ins and hospitals and 
old folks homes and all that and and they'd have gifts and Santa would come oh, oh, oh. and little kids would always ask Bill you know for this or that and he'd say well we'll see what we can do and I said Bill I'm going to use that on my own kids we'll see what we can do anyway um, one uh, one day when Tom was supposed to take Bill out, he got stuck in Des Moines. It was, you know, snow or I don't know what it was. And he couldn't think of, you know, he had all these dates and places for Bill to be that he was going to take him. He couldn't think of who might do it. So he called Jeff Portman, the rabbi, who said, why not? <laughs> and so the rabbi took Santa Claus to all of the events that day. That's just what Bill did. Okay, that's enough. That's a great way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, dear doll. Thanks. Thank you. Barry, on behalf of all of us uh, here in the libraries and the School of Social Work and at the University of Iowa, thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, libraries are places where, uh, where we really, we live the, the principles of inclusion and accessibility. Uh, libraries are also places where we collect and preserve stories for future generations. And we are truly privileged to be able to preserve Bill's story in partnership with, with Barry and Bev. And uh, it's just really wonderful that you're all here to help us open this exhibit tonight. So with many thanks, I wish you all a good evening. Uh, please come back to the exhibit many times over the course of the fall semester. Uh, bring your friends and uh, have a wonderful evening and thanks again for being here. Take care.